So this session is on sustainability, the drivers and barriers for governments. It is a critical topic as COP28 comes into the UAE later on this year, and as the energy crisis continues to impact markets and drives technological adaptation around our region. Governments around the region are also coming under some pretty intense uh, scrutiny, some intense pressure to diversify and to transition to lower carbon economies while also protecting economic growth. So we have a lot to talk about today. And I am thrilled to be joined by a really esteemed panel as well. They are brilliant, they are diverse, uh, but there is a common thread here because each of the gentlemen who we have on stage are leaders in their industries. They are decision makers who have each had a major impact on the direction and strategy of their organizations. So we'll jump straight into the conversation and thank you again for being with us. So Christian, I'd like to begin with you first as we look at this intersection between technology, uh, energy resilience and energy security. What is the common thread as the leader of a, a, a large organization in the energy technology space? Yeah, thanks very much and thanks for having me. Um, first of all, I think you cannot untangle this. We always have to be aware. At the end, it's about investing into infrastructure and doing this with projects which take time. And at the end, it's obviously thinking early enough about how do I build a sustainable, secure, reliable infrastructure which is able to withstand headwinds which I do not expect today. So I think you cannot really untangle these different elements and this is why it's so important that obviously we, we bring these different things together and say well, how are we best doing it and uh, technology, I would always like to underline, technology is in a lot of areas available, right? Don't, let's take technology not as a point to hold us up to implement. There is more technology needed, that's not the question, but we have lots of technology available to deploy. And uh, this is now the, the long-term alignment, what we need to really get, get going now, because it really needs to get started in terms of driving a more secure and sustainable energy system. Alan, would you like to weigh in on this as well? What do you see as the role of technology in shaping energy security and resilience today? Yeah, well, I agree 100%. And I think that what we see here, though, is the situation we're facing is bigger than any we've ever faced on a global basis, and we are behind. And so the fact that we have to think both short-term and long-term for sure, but we've got to get going, the good news about that is that in my opinion, it's going to change the way that we deploy the new technologies that will allow us to have sustainable, you know, power, energy, and also, you know, uh, have reliability. And the new technologies are the driver of that. The important part of that is that in the past, new technologies like wind and solar were basically deployed through wealthy governments, you know, providing incentives to have the cost curves come down. And once it got to be competitive in price, it could be deployed in other countries and by corporations. Now it's going to be different, in my opinion. Everybody realizes we have to move. We have to move faster. And so we're going to, we can all move at once. That new technologies, if you get the regulation and deployment in the wealthy parts of the world, then they can jump to the emerging markets and the combinat and corporations are going to really lean in and invest very heavily in the deployment of these because they know we need to have them for the future. And so I think this time around, if we bring business and, and governments and you know, regulators and not NGOs together, we can move a lot more aggressively than we have in the past. Mm. Um, Jeff, you have an interesting take on this as well as a builder of future cities. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, first off, it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate it. Um, I think if I have a position on this panel, it's probably a little bit more about the demand side of the equation. Uh, you know, working a lot with, uh, with citizens, with people in, uh, in cities and neighborhoods that need to adopt uh, some of this technology ultimately. And I think that we need to do a better job, all of us, about more clearly articulating the promise of this green transition. So yes, it's about carbon and smart power grids and charging stations, but we need to clearly articulate more about the, the healthy living, the happier and more connected citizens and, and be sure that we're joining those things up really, um, really authentically. So part of it is a, a little bit of a mind shift about not only our narrative, but our ambitions and how you know, really smart people leading businesses are, are thinking about how those ambitions for everyday quality of life can come to the fore. 
And the other thing, you know, we can also look at planning uh, a bit from previous examples of how public and private entities come together. So some of you might know about transit-oriented development. Um, it's been around for decades. It's a really smart way to get pr public sector investment in things like rail and transit stations together with real estate investment, right? So typically regulation allows developers to build taller, more dense around transit lines, and the investment in that real estate then helps pay for the infrastructure. And I think it would be interesting, be curious what you all think also about maybe developing energy-oriented development, right? Can we be smarter about urban planning and architecture um, where our green energy is going to be produced? Can we think more about how maybe subsidies between the investment in the actual land? First off, we can think a little bit wiser about where are we going to put things like wind, solar, nuclear uh, production facilities. Can we think wiser about that potential revenue helping to subsidize healthier um, cities and giving access to essentially higher quality of life for people? So there's maybe some, some well-tested um, models like transit-oriented development that we can learn from and change and tweak and, and think about something like energy-oriented development or something along those lines could be a, a, a nice way to very tangibly uh, connect public and private with citizens' interests in mind. Yeah, it's fascinating. And um, for the capital allocators who are on the panel, the other interesting question as well is, uh, how are we going to pay for it and how much is it going to cost, which is a pretty critical challenge when it comes to addressing these issues. But uh, here, I also wanted to hear from you. Um, you have a unique p uh, perspective on this as uh, not just the former Chief Investment Officer of the Japanese uh, Government Pension Board, but uh, also as a board member of Tesla. So give me your take on this. How do you see this uh, intersection between energy security and energy resilience? And what trends are you seeing in mobility in particular, given your role at Tesla, which is uh, arguably one of the most important companies in the world in this space today? Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, <clears throat> well, you g gave me a very big question. But the, uh, let me put my perspective as the, uh, the sort of professional uh, managing a big capital uh, I think the one, you know, the one of the big agenda for the investor for the last 10 years is how to put the money behind the necessary change or necessary innovation. So uh, all the energy transition and et cetera, we know it's necessary and that each government has their plan to how to introduce it. But we always have an issue that the, whether the private capital is following or even accelerating that, the, uh, that, that shift. And then that has not been really available or like not in place yet. And then the most common kind of excuse for no investment from the investor community is there's no you know, data, there's no transparency uh, of the, uh, the, the, the project. So uh, on one hand, the, uh, the UN has been pushing. I was a former you know, special envoy on the U UN to promote a sustainable investment where we pushed very hard for the global uh, disclosure, you know, financial uh, disclosure standard makers to come up with the sustainability uh, disclosure standard to basically the, take out excuses and also give the, uh, the uh, financial professional as the kind of like a basis for them to make a judgment. Uh, that's one thing which is, you know, that we need to push it. But with only that kind of like, a, you know, the approach, very conventional approach, you know, collecting data and then to put the money behind it it's not going to be quick enough and not the significant enough to promote this urgent shift of the sustainable energy. So uh, that's one thing we still need to work, work out. And from the perspective of like a Tesla, you know, you're going to hear directly from the horse's mouth. I think that Elon is going to be speaking uh, over, the net, you know, over the internet connection to you on Wednesday. But the, uh, we are the company who has a mission to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. And uh, we have been believing one of the, uh, the important approaches replace the internal combustion engine uh, with the electric vehicle. And then that's gradually happening and uh, we are you know the introduce you know inviting all the other competitors to build more EVs but one thing I just want to uh, throw into this discussion is you know each time maybe just uh, you know the Siemens uh, the project as well but you know, you know on one hand the government is trying to push private sector to build a more sustainable infrastructure but we cannot afford to spend like a two years to get approval from each government. So uh, that's happening in the like, uh, you know, uh, electric vehicle uh, regulation too. So I think that we really need to have the, uh, the government to really work 
at a much faster phase to incorporate the new technologies. And then uh, the other thing, the last thing I just want to put is, without the government intervention of strong leadership, consumer, not only consumer, but also the investor, tend to make a decision based on today's market price or today's available information. So any the government intervention or clear you know, indication where the whole industry or whole society is going will let the consumer make decision on the long-term based the, the, you know, the uh, trade-offs. So uh, not making a decision on today's oil price over you know, against today's electricity bill. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's kind of things that the government should be doing better. As we prepare to hear from Elon later on in the week, I just wanted to get your take on what's happening over at Tesla. Obviously, a business that's faced significant challenges in its scale up, particularly when it comes to production, intensifying competition, uh, not to mention other issues like regulation, for example, in the markets that you sell into and operate in. Um, Critics would also say that Elon, in a way, is also facing an additional pressure because he's stretched. Um, people say that he's distracted. Uh, how do you react to that? How do you respond to that? And how is he doing? It's, the, it's, <laughs> it's really a question whether he's a human or alien, but <laughs> he seems to have to an incredible bundles of his work, so uh, I just don't want to comment. I mean, you can ask him directly. But one of the things I just wanted to mention is like, Tesla has been pushing the regulator very, very hard, and then we got a lot of pushback. And the, some of our approach has not been very conventional, so we create a lot of debate and controversy. <laughs> but I think it's also reflect that the, uh, the arch we are feeling you know, so the, uh, the, we don't care about the, uh, the competition really because the, we are basically competing against the internal combustion engines. So the, we just need to, we have like another 80 plus percentage of the global car sales are still not EV. So uh, we are kind of competing against them. So we welcome all the competitors to come in to introduce better cars. And I disagree whenever Elon says, I don't mind the, uh, the Tesla getting, you know, the, uh, getting into bankruptcy if somebody else come up with a better car, which I disagree. But <laughs> I think that's the kind of like, uh, you know, the, uh, his philosophy and the Tesla's philosophy. We really wanted to shift the whole system or the transportation to sustainable, you know, the energy system. Hmm. So as a board, you don't think he's too stretched? I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth a try. I, I, I did my best. Um, Let's focus the conversation back over to this relationship between uh, public and private when it comes to uh, funding the energy transition, building energy security and resilience. Um, Christian, what's your view on how governments are working now with the private sector? What more would you like to see from governments in, in order to enable your business and where are the gaps? Yeah, first of all, I would like to, to pick up a couple of points because Tesla is an interesting example because it disrupted an, an industry um, and all the established players weren't able to do that. However, I think um, if you now transfer that to energy, we will see one fundamental difference. The product life cycles or the, the project life cycles in energy are extremely long, right? If we sell an offshore wind park today, it's going to be built in 27 or 28. If we build a high voltage power, or if it's supposed to build a high voltage power line, which then transport the electricity, it takes us seven to 10 years. So what you don't have in this industry is this kind of fail fast and disrupt the industry because until your revenues come, it takes you seven to 10 years. Who's going to take that bet really to drive the industry forward? So it will be very difficult to find this Tesla example to speed up the industry and we need speed up. And this is why I think you need this public-private partnership in a different way, which is really saying, yes, we want to do it. Yes, we want to rebuild an infrastructure. And we know it's an enormous investment program, the biggest in the, since the industrialization. And uh, that is something which comes probably with challenging fundamental beliefs which we all had. Private money is available. That's not the problem, right? Uh, enormous amount of, uh, of money is available, but the, making a planable business model around it and also the paybacks early enough will be the challenge because a lot of the infrastructure, what we're going to build, only going to be operational six, seven, eight, or 10 years down the road. So how do we crack this nut? And probably there, we need some more push from governments. And the other thing is, I think you indicated also, we need a Bureaucracy Reduction Act everywhere, on, in every country, uh, tremendously, because if it takes three years to get a project approved or five years to get a project approved, it will not work. It will take too long and money will not flow. 
Mm. Alan, can you speak to that as well? And also, where do you see the money flowing? What are some of the investment trends that, that you're watching right now? Well, we happen to agree on everything. <laughs> and so I think we also we need to create a more, if not totally global, we need to create more of a global public-private partnership because for a variety of reasons. There, there's going to be an investment on the scale of what's being talked about for a company like Siemens to say, okay, let us invest over a seven to ten year horizon. If governments would get together and put in regulations that said, if you meet these standards, it can be deployed in our countries and our regions, then you know you don't have to go through each country and find out if there's going to be a scalable market if you go and invest in it. And that's super important. The other side of the equation is there's actually so much more capital that wants to come into this market in a variety of ways, not only to produce the new things, but to provide the capital to the places that need it through credits. And the issue is there's billions of dollars on the sideline that wants to invest in carbon credits. The problem is there's no accepted market as to what a carbon credit really is. So if we could create a global standard of these are what carbon credits are, you would find there would be billions of dollars and those, that money could go to whatever municipalities or whatever regions want to you know, provide investments. So it can go into, look, our friends at the World Bank just put out a report that I've been working with them on about the underinvestment in the emerging markets. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be more investment. If you can get credits for doing things the right way, those credits could get this deployed a lot faster. And companies want to do it because they want to see it come down the cost curve, because they know they're going to have to be there five years and ten years from now. Mm -hmm. So putting these things together and then on the investment side, their investors want to invest behind these ESG things, but then if they see a business model that is sustainable. And one last thing I'll say. We, also, we know we need to invest in all of the new clean, uh, the nuclear, the hydrogen, all these things we need to invest in. But let's be clear, we're talking about sustainability, but also reliability, right? We need to have energy. And with the demand for power and energy, we have to make it clear that we have to increase our production of fossil fuels and natural gas on a very significant basis. And the part of that, one, we have to do it for security, and two, there are a number of technologies available today, like direct air capture and others, that can decarbonize the fuels that we go find if we want to burn them, so that we can you know, create both sustainability but also stability. And through, if we can just get together and do it, um, it will also create a lot of jobs and some growth that we need in the global economy. Alan, just to follow up on that, I'm, I'm curious as uh, someone of your experience who has uh, really built a career and a lifetime on Wall Street, do you think that uh, ESG investing in particular has become too politicized? Well, I'm, I'm going to try and think about a subject that hasn't become too politicized. Um, and so it, it clearly has, but a lot of it is because it is... It is not, you know, it's the way it's said. You know, ESG investing is not about we're going to invest in these things because we think it's the nice thing to do. The clear point of it is we want to invest in ESG because we know that long term, if we cannot have these things delivered by these companies, consumers aren't going to want to buy their products and everything else, and they'll be taxed and all these reasons. So ESG investment is really about investing. Larry, Larry Fink said it the other time. He said he thinks the next 100 unicorns are going to be basically, you know, companies that go to a billion dollars are going to be companies that are bringing the new technologies to fight climate. So ESG is just part of this. It is the right thing to do, but it's also the profitable thing to do. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I want your take on um, how this will ultimately impact the human experience at the end of the day, because this is something that you specialize in. And when you look at your own design philosophy, I know you were uh, mentioning before that one of the things that guides you and drives you is making public life an intentional driver for design policy and governance. So that is putting humans at the forefront. Why is that important? Yeah, I think it's, <clears throat> I mean, it is really important to just think a little bit about the human animal in all this and, uh, and bring some reality here, right? So in general, nice. I, I like to say very, very lovingly that humans are generally like very busy 
and pretty lazy. <laughs> um, or, or energy efficient, whatever you want to call it besides lazy, right? Um, and I think there's a real truth in what you were saying there, Alan, at the end, just about um, we, I think those that are fighting for sustainability, interested in climate, there's been a, there's been a discussion about basically trying to fight against, against human nature, telling all these folks, consume less, do less, um, and which is really, it's one thing in, the, in, in, in wealthy countries, but it's even more unfair in unwealthy countries, right? To say low-income folks, hey, no, you don't get more energy because it's dirty, or you don't get more opportunity because it, it uses more carbon. And I think we have to really change the dialogue. And what I, how I interpreted what you were saying is that we have to be honest. We're going to use more energy. We're going to have more people on the planet using more stuff, and that's good. We, then, then we, or if we're honest, then we're making sure that people are using more green energy or more clean energy and have better access to this opportunity, but there's a, there's a counter argument that I see in a lot of, you know, sort of my creative circles, you know, maybe outside of finance, that are just constantly talking about, you know, conserve, 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 and I just don't think it's, it's fair and it's not doing justice to, like, the real human experience, which is going to want, uh, want more things. So I'm interested in a shift that maybe we can agree across public and private towards abundance rather than scarcity, but then using technology and using the right um, sort of language and ambition uh, around human experience to get us there. Mm. Hiro, you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. And uh, can I just touch upon the ESG being politicized? Please. <clears throat> um, I have been advocating ESG for the last 70 years. And then I, the, the one way I think people should look at ESG or sustainable investment is, if you look at the, all the different agenda in the ESG, or you can use SDGs alternatively too, if you agree, any of those, the agenda, we fail to deliver what kind of risk we are going to you know, face. So ESG is the kind of like a collective approach of the, uh, the investment community to minimize the risk which goes beyond the typical investment horizon. Otherwise, they, uh, this is what the Mark Carney called the tragedy of the horizon. Every investor analyzed their risk return over the next three years, you know, two, maybe two months, three months, three years, five years, and they continue to roll until they reach the cliff. So uh, I think the ESG, that we should look at that as a way for the, uh, the, the, our society and our economy to avoid the risk, which we know it's going waiting for us in the future, mm. and the, to, be, to integrate that into today's investment decision. So we're rapidly running out of time. I'll give our panel some uh, time to have some final thoughts now as well. And Christian, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, just some parting words on World Government Summit, but also the key success factors for a sustainable transition. Um, what will it mean for the business? What's your immediate focus from this point on? No, I, these type of summits and these type of discussions, always we have to be aware we are privileged. And uh, we are privileged to be part of these summits, are part of these panels, and we are th the ones who have to drive it. There's options to take, right? We can influence things. We can do a lot of stuff, but we have to do it. And this would always be my pledge on, on, in these rounds. There's nobody else, right? I mean, if we don't get it together, if we don't drive either coming from the government or coming from the corporate side, then nobody else is there. We are the most privileged people on the planet who can drive it forward, so we better get started. Mm. Alan. Well, actually, a point I'd like to make on top of all these things is I think it's incredibly uh, great that we're having this conference in the UAE because I think the UAE has been a leader in a lot of things on technology for the region and on this subject here You know a community that has all this fossil fuel and is looking to the future is taking a leadership position in how we're going to create this transition because I think they really understand it and I think it's been great and I will make one prediction I honestly believe that when you look at where are their young populations? Where is their arable land? Where is there places you can put a lot of this new investment? I honestly believe that the UAE is gonna turn out to be the hub of where a lot of the things we're talking about happens. And I just wanna really thank them for hosting this summit because I think it's very important. I'll <laughs> Quick, quickly building on that, not only the, the UAE part, which I wanted to also really gush about, but since you got the applause, I don't want to <laughs> leave it at that. But I do believe that um, uh, not only in the UAE, but a lot of places where populations are young, I just want to emphasize, I've got a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old 
um, this generation alpha, <laughs> we have to be thinking much, much more about their needs and they're already pretty far ahead of the curve here, but if we can um, really have them in the forefront, that's gonna be important. Hero, mm -hmm. finally. Yeah, thank you. Well, I grew up in finance and I'm a genuine believer of free market and a market efficiency. But the problem is the market, the pers you know, perception of market being right is, it's right in the end. <laughs> And the problem with the other problem we are facing right now, we have no time to waste. So we need to make sure that the other market wouldn't waste our time trying to figure out what is the right direction. That's where we expect the government to intervene. And then we really need the efficient government because the bureaucracy itself, you know, we cannot afford it. So I think the the leadership that's shown by the UAE by you know gathering these people and uh, the other, uh, you are showing a lot of uh, the government level leadership and efficiency will, you know, they uh, put that as the, uh, the sort of like a role model because we really need efficient government and policy on the top of policy making. Mm. Well, gentlemen, I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you again for sharing your time with us. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon as well. And I wish you all the best for the rest of the World Government Summit. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.